I'm joined by the Fianna Fáil TD, uh, Jim O'Callaghan. Jim, thank you so much for uh, your time today and for coming to speak to us here on Slugger O'Toole. Um, You're welcome, David. I just want to ask a wee bit. Uh, obviously, um, uh, we're speaking to mostly a northern audience. Just want to ask, give you a wee bit of time. Just explain a wee bit about yourself, when you got elected and uh, how you've um, risen up the ranks of Fianna Fáil. Yeah, well, it's been a fairly slow rise, uh, if you can call it a rise. I was elected for the first time in 2009. I got elected as a councillor to Dublin City Council. And that was the first time I got elected, even though I'd run in locals and the general election before that. And I served as a Dublin City Councillor from 2009. I got re-elected in 2014, I think it was. And then I was elected to Dáil Éireann for the first time in February 2016. And I was elected for the constituency of Dublin Bay South, just from the point of view of an, a, a northern audience, it's the inner city, south inner city of Dublin, and it stretches as far as sort of University College Dublin and on the west side, it goes up as far as Cambridge, Charing York. So it's a four seat constituency. I got elected, as I say, in 2016, and then I got re elected uh, in February 2020. And I suppose as a TD for the first four years between 2016 and 2020, I was the justice spokesperson for Fianna Fáil. And during that, I managed to get an uh, important piece of legislation enacted, which is unusual for, uh, I suppose, an opposition spokesperson in, the, in that it's the Parole Act, which is now the law dealing with parole in this country. OK. And um, obviously, I wanted to ask you a wee bit about um, some of the developments that have been going on, um, particularly in the areas of North South, um, which have been in the news over the past um, uh, two or three weeks. So. In the budget two weeks ago, um, there was an announcement of a half a billion euro fund to complement what the new Shard Island unit is doing. So I just want to get your response about how important do you think this is? And uh, do you think that this will have uh, um, uh, any substantive impact on the topics of North-South cooperation? Yeah, I think it is very important. Like, you know, I'm a member of Fianna Fáil. We're in government now. We're a Republican party. It's very important to us that we advance north-south cooperation. There's obviously constitutional issues that will have to be considered as well. But I think the shared unit, uh, shared island unit within the Department of the Taoiseach is a very positive development. And I listened to the Taoiseach's uh, speech last week where he outlined a number of important factors. Obviously, when you look at the shared island unit, the, the, the principles are it's about trying to great, get greater cooperation in the whole area of our economies in terms of health and education and also specifically in terms of infrastructural development up probably in the north uh, west of the island and the border areas between the two jurisdictions so i think i welcome it i suppose when you look at the issues that we're really facing now at present uh, and that the, the biggest issues for the island they weren't issues six years or so if you think of issues such as brexit or COVID, they probably they weren't issues four years ago until the vote for Brexit. But like they are central issues and they've affected how we need to look at the island of Ireland and they've affected how we're going to do politics on the island. So I think the fact that we have a shared island unit within the Department of Taoiseach is necessary and it's also to be welcomed. You've also just, because you, you touched upon there, um, obviously one of the things that seems to be um, that the Tisha, the current Tishik is is very much trying to shy away from, and he mentioned this a lot when he spoke last week and has spoken uh, in the Dáil since. He obviously doesn't really want this unit to touch upon constitutional issues. I mean, what would be your view on that? Do you think that it should be tackling some of the issues around reunification? Well, I don't think he's shying away from it. Like the Taoiseach is the leader of Fianna Fáil. He's a Republican. His goal is my goal in that he wishes to see the reunification of the two jurisdictions on the island. But I suppose he has a lot of experience in terms of dealing with the sensitivity of the politics of this issue and how it needs to be uh, presented. But I do think it is an important development, the shared island unit. But in terms of the constitutional question, that is going to become more into focus over the next while. And as I said to you, like when you look back at the Good Friday Agreement, nobody would thought when the Good Friday Agreement was signed that whatever it is, 22 years uh, later, that the main issues probably triggering issues in relation to the constitution would be issues like Brexit, COVID, and indeed Scottish independence. Uh, these are factors that we have to weigh up. And I think we need to recognize, as indeed 
member, very significant unionist politicians have recognised is that there's going to be a border poll in the next while. I don't know when, but there will be one. And I think it's incumbent upon Republicans and nationalists to prepare for that so that we can put forward what our vision for a new Ireland would be in the same way. And, and I welcome this, that people such as Peter Robinson are recognising that the those who wish to cherish and promote the union see the value in pushing forward the reasons why they think the union should be preserved. So would you be, because obviously, um, and again, I appreciate Twitter is not the real world, um, but there was a lot of consternation online after, of course, in a press conference where Mial Martin was 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 talking about, um, obviously, um, that this wasn't something that, that his government would be pursuing in terms of a border poll. Um, and of course, that, that caused all sorts of consternation um, online. I mean, we, do, do you think that there, that there should be maybe some sort of firmer um, approach there? Maybe, maybe should, should, should they be talking about setting a date or should there be maybe some, some uh, framework or roadmap set out towards getting to a border poll? Well, I wouldn't be too worried about what the response is on Twitter. And obviously, a lot of people will try to use answers any politicians give in order to undermine that politician for their own political purposes. But it's an important question you raise. And like, let's go back and look at the Good Friday Agreement and look at the consequent legislation that was enacted by the Westminster Parliament, the Northern Ireland Act, 1998. Like, It's provided for that the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland may call a border poll if he believes that it's likely that a majority of people would vote for a united Ireland over remaining in the United Kingdom. Now, you'd be aware, David, that obviously was litigated and it came before the Court of Appeal this year, case brought by Mr. McCord. And the Court of Appeal said, listen, that's a political issue. It's not an issue for legalities to get into. I think that's correct. And it is a political issue. And ultimately, it will be a matter for politicians to decide, specifically as well as the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland to decide, well, is there going to be a border poll? But like we can't simply just wait around. My fear is that, you know, a border poll would end up the same way as the Brexit poll, which was chaotic, where people just had a very simplistic poll about, we want to get out of the EU, and nobody knew what was going to happen. So we are going to have a border poll, but I think it's incumbent upon nationalists and Republicans and I would put the responsibility to a large extent on Fianna Fáil and the SDLP to come forward with a, a position, a constitution for what would be a new Ireland so that people can see it and we're prepared for a border poll if it should happen you know, spontaneously in the future. I, 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 the reason why I'm asking you uh, this much, because I, I read um, uh, there was an analysis piece by Harry McGee in the Irish Times. And again, I know we have to probably put uh, commentators like myself and Harry in the same league as Twitter. But uh, but he mentioned, he referenced uh, you and he referenced uh, Barry Cowan as well. And he re-referenced maybe some of the nuances within Fianna Fáil that exist. Uh, Barry Cowan, I think, suggested maybe you could do a poll maybe later in the decade around the 30th anniversary of the agreement. I mean, would you be as prescriptive maybe as that? Like, is, there any, is, there any, is there any forward date in your mind about when you think could potentially be a good time to hold this? Well, listen, just in terms of Fianna Fáil, like, like in any political party, there are different strands within the political party. We all don't homogeneously think the same thing. And obviously this is an important issue for Fianna Fáil. The founding principle the first aim of Fianna Fáil is the unity and independence of Ireland as a republic. That's what we stand for. And let there be no doubt about it, uh, we are a Republican Party. But I think we need to recognise that this thing could unintentionally speed up very quickly without anyone realising it. Like, as I said, Chid, Scottish independence is going to be a big trigger in respect of this. What happens after the 1st of January when the United Kingdom leaves the European Union is also potentially a big trigger in this. And like when you look at the, uh, the views of young people in Northern Ireland, like I'm conscious there was a lucid talks poll out recently. And if you look at the 18 to 24 year olds, like something like 43% of them were in favour of United Ireland, 34 United Kingdom was saying the UK. And people are 25 to 44 was about the same, 42% in favour, 29 against. So like, I don't know when it's going to happen. But I do know, as Peter Robinson knows, it is going to happen. And like, I welcome what he's doing, but I think it's incumbent upon the rest of us to try and get people working on what will be an agreed constitution for a new Ireland. Because it certainly won't just look like, uh, OK, we bring in uh, the six counties into Dáil Éireann and Shannon Éireann and we operate like that. That's not going to happen. 
We need a broader vision and we need something that recognises the diverse identities of people on the island, including obviously and particularly the people who cherish their link with the United Kingdom. And obviously, just uh, just on that, obviously, you've referenced a few times there, Peter Robinson's um, uh, poll. I don't know if he timed that article to come out maybe just after Michal's address. But, um, but I mean, in terms of how, that, how that'll how that work, I mean, do you envisage seeing seeing what he's talking about in term, from a Republican perspective? Do you see that being maybe utilising the partnership you guys have with the SDLP? Do you maybe see working with the university or setting up an independent think tank? How do you envisage that potentially happening? Well, I, I think it needs to happen. That's the first thing I, I, I think. And also, like, I think we need to recognize that people have moved beyond uh, green and orange to a certain extent. Obviously, there's a lot of emotionalism about the whole national question, the constitution, the issue, the union or United Ireland. But like younger people don't look at it with the same green or orange tinted glasses. And, you know, my view is that I would like to avail of the uh, partnership with the SDLP, between Fianna Fáil and the SDLP, so we could advocate what we as you know, reasonable nationalists and Republicans view as being an agreed future for the island. And like, there's a responsibility on all other parties to do the same as well. But it is instructive that Peter Robinson sees the, the pro-union parties as having a, a duty to do it. And I think also Arlene Foster came out and said that she wants to make the union more appealing to everyone in, in Northern Ireland. So listen, there's a legitimate act of persuasion to take place there. Colm Eastwood said that it's down to an issue of persuasion. And let's not shy away from it, that each side and various other sides present their views as to what should be uh, the preferable constitutional position. Let's debate it. Let's prepare for it. Let's vote on it. And let's move on from it. And I also want to uh, bring up, you've talked about it there, the partnership between Fianna Fáil and the SDLP. Um, obviously, it's been going now for, I think, nearly two years now. Um, outside of, um, obviously, unification was a big part of it. But is there, you know, how, are you are you satisfied with how, with how that has been um, pursued? Are you satisfied with how that's been developed? Well, I think we need to be conscious of what happened. Like the partnership was announced in, I think it was January 2019, okay? And after that, I suppose there was huge concentration on the elections that were coming in Northern Ireland. I suppose, in fairness, you didn't know about the Westminster election until later that year. But certainly here, Fianna Fáil was on election mode for all of 2019. And then 2020, unfortunately, has been dominated by COVID to a certain extent, which has precluded enough cooperation. Listen, I would like to see more. Years ago in Ireland, you'd hear about couples getting engaged and they'd be engaged for years and you'd wonder, are they ever going to get married? <laughs> and similarly, like we've announced our engagement. I think we need to see more practical cooperation on the ground. And I think one of the ways to do it is to try to get an agreed constitution for the future of United Ireland between uh, SDLP and Fianna Fáil and we should work on that. So just for, I mean, just because you used the married analogy, so I can't help but pick that up there. Would you like to see um, uh, a merger between the, the two parties one day? Well, I suppose we have to be careful about using analogies, but listen, I would actually. Like, we are, Fianna Fáil is a Republican party. We believe in the unification and independence of Ireland. And if we're serious about that, it necessarily means that, you know, we should be contesting elections uh, in Northern Ireland. Like, obviously, the history of Fianna Fáil and the history of Northern Ireland, you know, there was always a recognition by most of republicanism that the, uh, you know, that Northern Ireland, the North was different. And I'm sorry to say that because when you look at partition, the people who probably suffered the most from partition were Northern nationalists. But back 100 years ago, even back in 1916, there was a recognition that the North was different. Now, those differences obviously has resulted in 100 years of partition. My own view is that that's been very damaging to everyone on the island and to the island as a whole. I think Southern Unionists were damaged by it. Southern nationalists were damaged. Northern Unionists, Northern nationalists, as I say, were damaged probably the most. But listen, let's try and use this opportunity now We've got a peaceful method set out in the Good Friday Agreement, and we should try to use that for the purpose of resolving a serious political issue through discussion, persuasion, and democracy. Oh, and I um, uh, just want to just move on to, to just a, a couple of quick issues just before 
um, uh, we go. Um, I noticed you were writing over the weekend about the pandemic and you were talking about the impact that this has had on younger people. Um, uh, and you're writing about that. Can you just elaborate a little bit on that in terms of um, in terms of what you're saying about obviously lockdowns, people are getting weary, and of course the impact on some other sections of society. Listen, this is an extraordinary uh, health and political event, and no matter what decision any government makes around the world, there are risks associated with it, and no government is going to get it right completely and everyone's saying oh look at New Zealand and Australia let's wait to see how things are going there in six months before we start passing judgment but the concern I have is that we can see the consequences of this disease and the impact it's having we see it in the number of deaths there's 1882 deaths in uh, in the south there's something like 658 deaths in the north so we can see immediately the consequences on death we can see the consequences in terms of hospitalizations what we don't see are the consequences of the restrictions. And I think the consequences of the restrictions are going to be very negative. And you're right, I wrote yesterday in the Sunday Business Post about how lockdowns are impacting upon young people. And I think we have to discuss this and recognise that like it has upended their education. It has had very significant impacts upon their employment. Like down here, unemployment for youth, youth unemployment is 37%. Over 100,000 people lost their job last week. And a huge number of them are young people in low-paid jobs. If you look at young people's pastimes, even children, they can't go to music class, they can't go to dance classes, young boys and girls can't play sporting fixtures. So their pastimes have been affected. Then their entertainment, they go to gigs, they go to bars, they go to restaurants, all closed. And then their relationships are affected. Now listen, this is not about weighing up, saving uh, you know, old people on one side and letting young people live on the other side. But what, what I advocated is that we need to try and have a, a more measured policy that let's have as our policy, let's protect the elderly and protect the young rather than just focusing everything on one particular aspect of this disease because the social societal consequences, the mental health consequences, the economic consequences are going to be very severe. And obviously it's a, it's a hard time to be in government. Um, it's soft. Oh, yeah. It's the worst time to, to go in. Uh, uh, and obviously Fianna Fáil went in uh, right in the middle of it uh, in June um, I just want to talk a little bit about the polling data again. The, the benefits of being in government still seem to be going to Fine Gael um, uh, and again Sinn Féin, still holding up support as the official opposition. What do you think the Fianna Fáil could potentially do in the next, um, in the next while to, to, to lift its ratings from the, the, the mid-teens? I know it's, it's, it swings about. Um, what do you think it could do to, to lift its ratings and uh, its profile in government? Well, I think it's a fair, that's a fair analysis you've come up with there. Like we are uh, in a difficult position uh, in the polls. Um, Fine Gael obviously got a bounce after the election. Like we got 22% in the election. Fine Gael got 20%. Um, you know, Sinn Féin got 24%. So like obviously the pandemic has affected politics. And a lot of that is people are very fearful about it, they're correct to be, and they're very concerned about it. But like my hope, and my, my hope was that as Fianna Fáil got into government and managed this crisis competently, that we would gain some of the pro-government support that exists. Um, and you're right, at present it appears to be going to Fine Gael. But listen, let's give it time and hopefully Fianna Fáil will get some of the benefits of that. I also think, however, that it's very important that this government is different to the last government. We can't simply be seen as a, a satellite of Fine Gael. We have to ensure that Fianna Fáil policy is to the fore of this government. And if you look at the policies, some of them have been, but we probably haven't got recognition for it. If you look at the job stimulus package back in July, that was very much Fianna Fáil policy. I doubt the budget would have been as expansionist had it not been for Fianna Fáil's presence there. But we just need to claim the credit of it. And when the pandemic passes, really we'll be judged on our performance on housing because the biggest social issue after the pandemic is housing down here. And Fianna Fáil is a very clear policy. We need to build public housing on public land and we'll be judged on that. Yeah, and uh, the, the, this is going to be my, my last question to you. Um, obviously, housing, health were the two big issues um, before the election. And you're right, once that recedes away, you're going to have a recession. Obviously, Fianna Fáil got very badly burned from its last time in government, governing in a recession. Um, how do you foresee Fianna Fáil being able to 
to navigate these uh, these choppy economic waters better than it was able to between 2008 and 2011. Well, listen, the good thing about Fianna Fáil is it's a national party. It's a centre ground, centre left national party. We have members in every part of Ireland and there are members who are committed to the party. So obviously the last time there was a global recession, OK, and Fianna Fáil suffered in the same way as PASOK in Greece suffered, in the same way as the socialists in Portugal and Spain suffered, uh, in the same way as other parties around the world who were in government at the time suffered. And now we have another crisis in terms of nobody can be seen to be to blame for this particular crisis in terms of the pandemic. But we just have to ensure that we govern competently and we set out a vision for the public. That the public are fair when it comes to government. They know it's easier to be in opposition and it is much easier to be in opposition. But they will judge us by the performance of the government. And if we perform competently in government and set forward a vision of hope for the future, I think people will come around to recognising that Fianna Fáil deserve credit and support for that. Okay, Jim O'Callaghan, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, David.